Presented by Caltech. Planet Earth has evolved over hundreds of millions and in fact billions of years to capture sunlight and it has innovated over that time through evolution to take that sunlight and do incredible work that gives us everything that we cherish on planet Earth. The Sunlight to Everything initiative borrows from that theme and imagines innovative technologies that likewise will take sunlight to do an enormous number of things, either directly or indirectly. And the more efficiently we can do that and the more direct we can make those processes, the less wasteful they become, the less energy they consume, and ultimately they become renewable and hopefully zero carbon. I think most of us that are scientists and engineers figure that planet Earth will figure this out and be just fine in the long haul but it's mankind's place on planet Earth and our relationship with it that we're all getting increasingly worried about. And it's not just news coverage, it's that we're all beginning to see it in real time. But to have hope, what you also need is the possibility that you can come up with solutions. It's very hard to predict exactly what you're going to discover. That's the essence of discovery. And often the beauty of science is discovering that which you didn't expect and often figuring out that you were wrong and that there were uh, things hidden behind a corner that wind up being much more fascinating, much more fruitful, and potentially even much more impactful. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dennis Doherty. I am the chair of the Division of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering at Caltech. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's Watson lecturer, Jonas Peters. A little background, Jonas is a Chicago guy. He was born in Chicago, went to the University of Chicago as an undergraduate, uh, a fellowship in England, then a PhD at MIT, a postdoc at Berkeley, and then he came to Caltech as an assistant professor and he spent most of his academic career here, and he is now the Bren Professor of Chemistry. I won't tell you about Jonas's science, I'll let him do that, but of course he's internationally recognized for developing catalysts and photocatalysts with applications in renewable solar fuel technologies. And of course, since 2015, Jonas has been the director of the Resnick Sustainability Institute, and he is now stewarding the uh, second decade of the Resnick Institute, which has been, of course, transformed by the remarkable gift of Stuart and Linda Resnick. On the personal side, um, Jonas is married to Diane Newman, who you have a chance to hear from in a month. Uh, they have a son together, Ronan. Um, if you see Jonas walking across the campus, he'll likely be accompanied by his dog, Blue Jay, who's extraordinarily popular in CCE. Uh, Blue Jay has been described as the emotional support dog of the Schlinger building, and the students love seeing him around. Uh, Jonas loves hiking and camping, serious hiking in the Sierras. Um, he also loves baseball. Uh, he's a founding member of the Caltech Wood Baseball Bat Club. I'll let you contemplate that one for just a minute. So the good news is he's a uh, baseball fan. That's important. Bad news is he's a Cubs fan. Uh, we have not been able to convince him to become a fan of the world champion Los Angeles Dodgers, but we're working on that. But seriously, Jonas is a fantastic colleague and a great scientist and just as contributing greatly to Caltech. And it's my pleasure to introduce his talk, which is entitled Sunlight to Everything, Catalysis for a Sustainable Future. Take it away, Jonas. All right. Well, thanks, Dennis, for the introduction and the remarks and for the record, uh, I am a Dodgers fan. Actually, that was always my second love, the Dodgers. And in fact, I got to meet them uh, as a young kid in the dugout, thanks to my uncle uh, who had some connections. Uh, even had a Steve Yeager uh, catcher's mitt and baseball bat, just for the, the record. But the Cubs are my first love. And so uh, I do root for them uh, primarily, uh, uh, but they're not always in it as the Dodgers are. Um, so I'd like to thank the organizers for the Watson uh, lecture series here at Caltech, not just for affording me this evening's opportunity, but for bringing this type of content to the broader community in general, including in this virtual format, which we've been forced to use uh, this year. I naturally want to thank this evening's virtual participants. So thank you to all who are uh, online uh, to learn a little bit from this evening's presentation. I'd like to give a special shout out to some of my family members and friends. Uh, uh, 
owing to tonight's virtual format, many of them, uh, or at least some of them, I hope are able to participate. And most of them have never uh, heard me lecture before, at least not in a formal context. I'm sure some of them would argue they hear me lecture all the time. Uh, that said, joking aside, it is my sincere pleasure to be able uh, to share with you some of what motivates our research on the topic of solar-derived fuels and on the exciting work going on in our chemistry laboratories, and I mean that in a collective sense, at Caltech. Much of the work that I'll share with you and indeed the ideas that we're tossing around that motivates the work are highly interdisciplinary and collaborative, so I want to thank uh, CCE uh, for providing an opportunity and a camaraderie uh, to make that possible. I also want to thank the Resnick Sustainability Institute, for which I'm uh, currently director, for uh, providing me with an enormous opportunity to help leverage our institute's work, uh, my division's work, and even some of the work from my own laboratory uh, towards problems in sustainability. And then I'd also like to acknowledge uh, investments from the Department of Energy via the Joint Centers for Artificial Photosynthesis and most recently, uh, the Liquid Sunlight Alliance. So these are very large scale investments that the Department of Energy is making in the area of sustainability. And I'll give a little more information about that, but that's been transformative as well at Caltech uh, and continues to be. And finally, I just uh, won't have time to thank everyone individually, but I'd like to thank uh, the members of my lab and the collective labs that are working on these endeavors, students, postdocs, uh, research scientists, et cetera. So with that, uh, let me get started. Uh, it's Earth Week and tomorrow is Earth Day. And so it seemed appropriate to show you a, a picture of the blue marble. This is kind of an iconic sort of image of planet Earth that was imprinted on our collective psyche uh, back in 1972 when the Apollo 17 space crew were able uh, to bring this type of image back to Earth. And uh, it's a wonderful view, but it is a view that reminds us of the finite size of our home planet and by definition, therefore, uh, the finite size of its resources. This is another view of Earth uh, depicted instead using PowerPoint, showing a perspective where we see a planet operating at the nexus of mankind's need for food, water, the energy needed to provide them along with most everything else that we at least think we need and do. Uh, this next image uh, is uh, metaphorically an image that is meant to express climate change uh, and the climate crisis uh, that uh, um, uh, is largely caused, not entirely, but certainly significantly caused by mankind's unstoppable march. Uh, this is an unsettling view, or at least it's meant to be. Again, it's a PowerPoint view. Uh, and it becomes more settling with each year as the impacts of climate change uh, become facts of our everyday lives rather than ju just topics of spirited discourse. Make no mistake, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions are a primary cause of a global climate change in the modern era, and they present a challenge to which we must commit ourselves uh, and indeed do so straight away. So I don't wanna dwell on that image. I think we get a lot of that in the news. I wanna instead uh, uh, bring back an image that's a little bit more hopeful. Uh, somewhat of a better view, imagining, if you will, that by, lean by leaning on the infinite resources of the sun uh, as an energy source, just as Earth always has, we can come uh, with time into better harmony with our planet's own limited resources. To truly harness this vast resource is an enormous task, and it's one for which we have to get creative about using sunlight, either directly or indirectly, to power most everything we need and do as a society. This requires bold innovation and investment and research and development here at Caltech, uh, around the country and around the planet. Uh, and, and make no mistake, there's no investment that's more worthwhile. Everything counts on this. Before diving further into the innovation topics I'd like to talk about uh, in this context of turning sunlight into everything, let's get a little bit familiar with our current energy portfolio shown by this uh, pie graph depiction and how it breaks down for purposes of, of, of this talk. Uh, I'd like to only emphasize a US-centric view for now. Uh, the numbers change a little bit if you go to a global picture, but the uh, end results uh, uh, and conclusions one might draw are still similar. Um, uh, as you can see from the graphic, uh, despite all the Teslas and some of the spirited Chevy Bolts, 
uh, driving around Pasadena these days, most of our energy resources come from natural gas and oil and coal. So about 80% of our energy in the United States still comes from uh, uh, those uh, fossil fuels, about 8% from nuclear power, uh, and about 11% from renewable energy. About 9% of the renewable energy uh, is solar. And so if you take 9% of that, 11% of that total pie, that gets you to about 1% of total power currently comes from the sun. And that actually produces about 70 gigawatts of power uh, uh, total installed solar capacity in the United States right now, which is remarkable, but it's still only 1% uh, of the pie. So just to give you uh, a sense of what that means to those of you not familiar with gigawatts. So 76 gigawatts is enough to power about 23 billion LEDs or uh, uh, 23 uh, um, uh, million homes, for example. And if you happen to be a movie buff, uh, and remember the film Back to the Future, that'll power about 70 or so of Doc uh, Brown's uh, time-traveling DeLoreans uh, in that movie. Okay, so that is uh, what we consume currently in broad measure, about 80% still from fossil fuels. And then in what capacity do we use that energy? So it breaks down to about 60-40, uh, with a, a, a little bit of... Uh, uh, of, of um, uh, uh, if you'll forgive me a little bit on the numbers, it's roughly 60-40, uh, a little bit less on electricity and actually a little bit more on primary fuel as of today, I think. But 40% in electricity, and then you've got 60% still coming from these primary fuel sources, so the burning fossil fuels directly for transportation, uh, industrial manufacturing, and maybe, for example, residential and commercial heating. And then, of course, we still use fossil fuels to derive a lot of the electricity, but that's also where our renewables are chipping in, as well as, obviously, nuclear energy. What can we do in the future? I mean, if we don't want to take all this from fossil fuels, which obviously, or at least 80% of it from fossil fuels and, and emit so many greenhouse gases, this is a graphic uh, that, well, it's a, a modified version of a graphic that was published back in 2009 uh, that illustrates, I think, a very important point and sets up uh, the rest of the lecture. Uh, so this was done, uh, it's a graphic from Perez and Perez back in 2009, and they modified this graphic with uh, slightly different numbers in 2015. But if we don't quibble about the size of each number, but instead the message that it drives home, uh, I, I think we can uh, find it very useful. So if you look on the right side of this graph, you see our typical uh, total reserves, at least total estimated reserves of natural gas, oil, coal, and also uranium, for example, uh, which is used for nuclear. And the size of the circles is meant to indicate the relative size of how much we have of those reserves in their entirety on planet Earth. So again, there's some uncertainty in the uh, absolute size of these circles, and those change with time a little bit, but not so much uh, 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 relative to the, the take home message I wanna give. On the left side are the annual renewable resources that we have uh, as a planet. So the large yellow circle, that's sunlight. And you can see that it's massive. Not only is it massive by comparison to all of these other uh, fossil fuel and, and, and nuclear reserves, but we get a renewed installment of that solar capacity every year. The circles on the right, we got once over millions of years. We're not getting them back during uh, mankind's time here on planet Earth. On the left, we get that power every single year. So the ta we <laughs> tap the keg, it runs dry, and we get a new keg every year of that. Uh, it's, it's a one-time deal on the right side. The other point is that the smaller dots that you see on the left, which are other forms of renewable energy, are, of course, much smaller than the uh, solar capacity that we might derive from sunlight. Uh, that's not surprising. These other forms of renewable energy uh, are a direct consequence of, of sunlight. And so this is a massive resource and drives home uh, the message that we want to learn how to capture as much of this resource as we can and turn it into the work that we need to do. This is not a new idea, not for any of you, not for me, and it's not an idea, a new idea even if you go back in time. So if you uh, Turn back the clock to from the seventh to the third century BC, for example, the uh, ancient Greeks and Romans were using sunlight uh, uh, concentrated by magnifying glasses to light torches. It's even said that Archimedes in the ancient city of Syracuse uh, 
instructed the Greek Navy at the time to use concentrated sunlight uh, to set a fire to enemy Roman ships. Uh, I don't think that is a terribly fast process, and it's perhaps not surprising uh, that the Greek Empire did not uh, fare very well against the Romans if that was their strategy. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it was an attempt to try to use sunlight to do work. Uh, so we'll give them an A for effort, even if uh, it didn't work out so well. If you fast forward a couple thousand years, and obviously I'm skipping a lot of things in between, uh, there's a Swiss scientist, De Saussure, uh, who was able uh, to, he was an inventor slash scientist uh, who uh, devised uh, a solar oven, so a, constant, uh, a device to concentrate sunlight uh, and be able to cook something inside of it. So not a very uh, uh, high temperature oven. It could only get up to about 230 degrees Fahrenheit or about 110 degrees Celsius, but enough to boil an egg and, uh, and, and that was progress. So that's sunlight uh, to something that we need to use to do work. And then if you fast forward another 200 years, things get a little more serious. And this is an iconic picture of Pearson, Chapin, and Fuller at Bell Labs in 1954. Uh, this team, among with other uh, co-workers, of course, uh, is <clears throat> credited with discovering and demonstrating the first silicon-based solar cells. So this re really revolutionizes what you can imagine with sunlight to everything. What you see in the picture is a lamp that's uh, shining on some silicon solar cells. And then uh, a little bit to the right, you see an amp meter that they're watching. So the lamp is shining light, and these solar cells are turning that light into flowing electrons that run through this amp meter and can be recorded. And so if you've got flowing electrons, you can now really begin to do work, that's electricity. Uh, and so that began to, of course, capture the public imagination as well as the imagination from commercial investment. And so this is a, a fun image from 1956 from Look Magazine uh, showing you sort of an early prototype uh, of uh, uh, a photovoltaic solar cell. So this is, if you will, where things begin. If you fast forward another 65 years, lots of innovation in uh, uh, science, engineering, industrial manufacturing, and, uh, and what have you, we now have images like this, where you have massive scale solar capacity in the United States and elsewhere uh, around the world installed to take sunlight, capture it, and turn that sunlight into electricities that can feed into power grids and help us do the work we need to do as a society. So this is a, a beautiful image of a solar star project here in California that currently can operate at maximum installed solar capacity to the tune of about 580 megawatts installed on 3,200 acres. There are larger uh, such solar farms now being built. And if you go to the Middle East or China, uh, even larger than those in the United States, but let's just say that uh, momentum is moving and it's exciting from that perspective. Uh, this is a graph that tries to show you uh, what that looks like here in the United States. Uh, you can see that uh, we had a steady rise in installed solar capacity over the last 20 years, but around 10 years ago, things really took off. And so we get almost a two order of magnitude increase in just the last decade, which is remarkable. I mean, that is just fantastic and we need to keep that going. But I still remind you that of the total energy pie, we're still only at about 1%. And so we have a long way to go. Uh, I think we're gonna get there and I'm excited to see that happening. So while that's good news, there is some news that challenges us. And that's uh, like with all uh, renewable energy sources and especially with sunlight, uh, the supply is not constant, which is one of the advantages of burning fossil fuels. And so this slide uh, tries to drive home that message. So as you go through the day from uh, the wee hours through the morning to the afternoon and back to night, you get sort of a peak solar supply because that's when the sun is shining brightest. And that uh, peak solar uh, supply is not terribly well correlated with our use. And so, for example, when you get home from work on a typical day, uh, that's when peak demand goes up. But of course, the solar supply is going down because uh, you're reaching the end of the day and sometimes going into the evening. So this is a challenge. We've got all these electrons coming in from solar, photo, solar photovoltaics, and we need to take these electrons and do work with them. But we don't always need to do the work when the sun is shining at its brightest. And so that gets us to the point uh, that I want to spend the rest of uh, uh, the time this hour talking about. And that is that we need ways to capture and store 
solar energy. We need ways to take those electrons and put them in a bank for a little while till we really need them. Now, that's not a new idea, of course. All of us have rechargeable batteries uh, at home, and some of us are now having them in our cars, and otherwise, some of them are even using them sometimes to uh, uh, power aspects of our homes. Uh, and so batteries are a chemist's way of storing energy. So batteries are uh, simple chemistry that allow you to store electrons and use them on demand. Uh, I'll emphasize that this is a huge opportunity, and there's a lot of new innovative science that needs to happen in the battery space to make them uh, uh, better able to uh, service our needs for, for uh, energy storage. And so I have a young colleague here at Caltech, Kim C, in, in my division, uh, who's doing some exciting work about uh, on, on new innovative ways to um, uh, create batteries, uh, science for the future. And I hope someday you'll be able to uh, hear some of her ideas about that. Another way we can store electrons is as a chemical fuel. And most of you have heard of hydrogen fuel and the hydrogen economy. Uh, even if you don't understand exactly how that works yet. Uh, hydrogen is a molecule that essentially can be generated by water electrolysis. I'll give a little hint of what I mean by that momentarily. And so that hydrogen can be a chemical, a gas chemical that can be stored and transported and then combusted when it's needed. So this is another wonderful way uh, to store fuel. And I think this is gonna play a huge role, hopefully not just uh, uh, in other countries around the planet, but increasingly in our country as well. So these, if you will, are sort of known technologies where there's still a lot of progress to make and there's a lot of exciting work going on uh, here at Caltech to innovate, to make these more efficient. But let's call these at least uh, 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 somewhat uh, far along in terms of progress where you can actually do uh, real uh, uh, techno-economic analysis and make things work in society. <clears throat> Much of the work that my lab does and a lot of the exciting work going on at Caltech is a little more far reaching. And so we want to store electrons as fuels, but we want to think about other types of fuels. So this is uh, an image that depicts photosynthesis. So you see the sun and a plant and you see carbon dioxide and water being combined with sunlight, uh, ultimately liberating oxygen and giving you the sugar molecules that are fuel for the plant and ultimately fuel for us as we burn uh, the products of plants, uh, whether it be the uh, wood itself or, for example, the oil that you get from decaying plants over uh, many millennia and millions of years. So in essence, sunlight is the energy in this process that nature has evolved to push hydrogen atoms, which are fuel currency, from a molecule of water over to the carbon atom of carbon dioxide that triggers the chemistry that allows you to make sugar molecules that are fuel. Uh, the byproduct of that is oxygen, which is, of course, a benign product and even a desirable one if you need to breathe uh, like, uh, uh, like we do. So we would like to borrow conceptually from this kind of scheme at Caltech, and not just at Caltech, but with partner institutions and, frankly, a lot of research institutions all around the world, to try to devise uh, artificial photosynthetic schemes that will allow us to repurpose the idea of photosynthesis towards a whole variety of outcomes that we would like to be able to do. So I have a simple graphic on this next slide that tries to capture that idea. What we would like to do is to be able to take carbon dioxide, whether it's directly from the atmosphere or more likely from a concentrated source like the smokestack of an industrial power plant or an industrial manufacturing plant. We'd like to combine that carbon dioxide just like in photosynthesis with water and sunlight and uh, a little chemical factory that I'm gonna call an electrochemical CO2 conversion factory for the moment to pump out products that we wanna be able to use from that carbon dioxide. So those products could be fuels, just like uh, the wood you get from photosynthesis or the oil you get uh, eventually from photosynthesis. And those fuels can then be uh, looped back into transportation or to uh, heat or power a home. That'll of course liberate CO2 via emissions but we get the CO2 back in this closed loop process because we're doing CO2 conversion to make the fuel in the first place. Another exciting opportunity is to make chemical feedstocks from that carbon dioxide. So use sunlight uh, and the electrons you derive from it and the carbon dioxide and transform the carbon atoms from the carbon dioxide to all kinds of useful chemical feedstocks or materials that uh, power society, make all the things we need in society and allow us to do 
all the things we're accustomed to being able to do. So that's kind of an exciting vision uh, and there's a ton of work to do here. So what I can tell you is this is pretty far reaching and the electrochemistry that I'm gonna talk about next that we need to be able to do these things uh, still has large science gaps that we need to solve. And frankly, that's why it's the type of problem that scientists like myself and other scientists here at Caltech, along with our partners, are interested in doing. So with that, I'd like to shift into that topic. And so we have a, a large consortium of faculty, well, not a large, but a, a, a consortium of about eight or nine faculty here at Caltech, along with a number of staff scientists and a variety of graduate student and postdoc staff and even some undergraduates who are doing research on this endeavor uh, in what we call the Liquid Sunlight Alliance that we abbreviate as LISA. I want to acknowledge Harry Atwater uh, for being willing to be the director of this project and uh, doing some fantastic science himself, in addition to herding all the cats uh, 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 to make this multidisciplinary endeavor work. And I also want to thank our partner institutions, so a variety of universities uh, on the West Coast, as well as uh, partner national uh, energy national labs that are focused on uh, energy research. So this is again, multidisciplinary collaborative effort. So let me dive now into some of the details uh, about what I mean by uh, uh, this project. What are we trying to do in LISA? So this is a graphic artist's representation uh, that tries to capture a little bit more from a chemist's perspective what we're actually trying to do, a chemist's and a chemical engineer's perspective, and maybe an applied physicist or two. Uh, and so what you see here on this depiction are again, molecules of carbon dioxide. And in this case, they're actually drawn like molecules of carbon dioxide, if you're used to looking at them this way. You also see molecules of water that I'm pointing to down here. Uh, on the left, you see uh, something that kind of looks like a solar photovoltaic that sort of imagines you're capturing energy from the sun and transferring it in the form of electrons to this chemical factory in the center that we're calling a catalytic reaction center. So in here is where we're gonna take carbon dioxide, water, the energy from light, and essentially uh, uh, the uh, power of uh, electrons or at least capacitance to drive chemical reactions uh, that we want to happen in this reaction center that then allows you to make product molecules, whether they're gas or liquid product molecules that you can then separate that are the types of things society needs to do an enormous number of uh, things that drive uh, all the processes that we need. So I'll talk a little bit about this on a couple of less complicated slides, I hope, in a moment. Um, so this is obviously a lot of stuff to bring together. And so trying to integrate all the pieces to pull all this off uh, has associated with it a lot of issues and questions we have to try to solve. And so while there's a lot of basic science going on, we also have to evaluate performance within LISA of how these uh, multi-component devices might work, the dur durability uh, 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 of these devices, and what are the rates at which they can actually produce the types of, uh, for example, commodity chemicals we wanna make. So let's take a close up look at one part of this. And this is actually where uh, the action happens for chemists. So that's the catalytic active sites that are in these little chemical factories where we wanna make uh, products that are really useful for mankind from CO2, water and sunlight. Okay, so now I'm gonna give you a slightly less beautiful uh, 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 Jonas Peters <laughs> graphic image rather than an artist graphic image of what this catalytic reaction center looks like. So I'm giving you sort of a, let's call it an abstract set of atoms on the bottom of the slide. And that's meant to be uh, a metal electrode. So each atom might be some type of metal. And let's simplify that a little bit further and let those atoms uh, be flattened out into a planar surface. And so now I'm just showing you a planar electrode. So that can be something like a piece of nickel or copper or platinum or what have you. Uh, it, it's just a piece of metal that conducts electrons. So the key thing is that electrons that come from sunlight can flow through this, uh, <clears throat> this type of metal material. And if that can happen, if those electrons can flow through the material and encounter protons indicated by that blue positive charge that came in from the top of the screen, you can combine them to make a hydrogen atom. So remember one proton and one electron is the definition of a hydrogen atom when you bring them together. And if you bring two of those protons and two of those electrons together, as depicted here, you make two hydrogen atoms. And in essence, you make 
uh, the molecule we call hydrogen, which is a diatomic molecule with two hydrogen atoms in it, and that is hydrogen fuel. And when you combust hydrogen fuel, you essentially, uh, using a hydrogen fuel cell, you pull the protons and electrons back out of it to do work. So for lots of metals, you can do this with lots of electrons. So if, uh, if they conduct well, you can have a lot of electrons flow through it, and they can encounter protons from solution shown by those blue plus charges. And when they combine, they can again make hydrogen atoms. So each proton and each electron can form a hydrogen atom. And that, if you will, can decorate the surface of the electrode. With that surface decorated with these stored hydrogen atoms on it, what can happen is that those hydrogen atoms are mobile and they can, if you will, slide together like this. And that can make new types of bonds between the hydrogen atoms which then allow you to make the molecules of hydrogen that are fuel. So this metal electrode is using electrons, for example, derived from the sun via a photovoltaic. And then those electrons are being combined with protons from solution to make these hydrogen molecules. That's fuel in a stored capacity. So we took the sunlight and stored it as this hydrogen fuel. If you keep doing that, so the electrode can keep allowing protons and electrons to combine, you can make more hydrogen. And if that keeps going, what we have uh, at the bottom is a metal catalyst and not just a catalyst, but what we might call an electrocatalyst because it's a catalyst that delivers electrons to a substrate uh, via an electrode. Some metal catalysts are wonderful at making hydrogen. So for example, platinum is a terrific metal for making hydrogen. And uh, were it not so expensive um, because it's so rare, it would actually be a great uh, solution to the hydrogen problem. Much of the research uh, that's gone on, not much of the research, but a lot of research that's gone on at Caltech, including some from my own lab, has been focused on uh, trying to ascertain whether we can use metals much less expensive, much more earth abundant than platinum uh, as catalysts for making hydrogen. And there's been a huge amount of progress on that front. So that actually looks super promising. But we don't always want hydrogen. Actually, to do much of what we need, we do not want hydrogen. And so what uh, products can we make uh, other than hydrogen? So let's start talking about some of the carbon-containing products we want to make, because those are the types of products we can derive from carbon dioxide to close the CO2 emission cycle. And so let's think about products like ethylene, ethanol, propane, and propanol. So uh, uh, ethanol, for example, is something that you can combust in, in, in a vehicle. You can convert it into other, other types of uh, very important commodity chemicals. Propane is uh, a type of fuel that you can store in a large tank and heat your home. And ethylene is the type of molecule you can use in industrial manufacturing. Uh, in fact, let's talk about ethylene for a little bit because we have some exciting work going on in this area. So ethylene is a hugely important molecule globally in industrial manufacturing. It's one of the top three or so molecules we produce as a commodity chemical currently on planet Earth to the tune of about 200 million metric tons per year. And I'll come back to this as to why we use it uh, and also some of its CO2 emissions. But we would like to be able to make ethylene, which has two carbons in it, from carbon dioxide. And if you want to think about doing that, you want a metal that's not great for making hydrogen, but instead might be great for making ethylene from carbon dioxide. And so what kind of metal material might be good for that? It turns out not many, and it's not clear yet, but maybe just one, maybe just copper. Uh, certainly current research points to copper as the very best, best material for doing this by a large margin. So copper or a copper electrode like you see depicted here uh, can make hydrogen, but it also has the ability to interact with carbon dioxide as I'll show you and allow you to make a lot of other products from it. So when you, uh, when I see a building like the recently developed, uh, and designed and, and built beautiful uh, Chen Institute for Neuroscience here at Caltech, uh, I see a building where there's gonna be great neuroscience going on. And I mean, no disrespect to that, but when I walk by that building, what I see is a massive copper electrode that can be used to take CO2 out of the atmosphere and turn it into all kinds of commodity chemicals that we need. I don't know if the division chair of biology and bioengineering will let us run that experiment, but maybe this, this talk will help convince him. So let's zoom in on a copper electrode. So instead of a generic piece of metal, now I'm gonna call the bottom bar a copper catalyst. 
And if you will, that same copper catalyst, just like platinum or the generic metal electrode, has already had electrons and protons flow to it. So it's still decorated with hydrogen atoms. But because it's copper and not platinum, maybe it doesn't have quite as many hydrogen atoms decorated on it. It's not quite as good at making hydrogen. And so that leaves some space for other kinds of molecules to interact with it. For example, molecules like carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide can come in, it can lay down on the copper surface, and all of a sudden chemistry can happen that allow you to take this gas molecule that we consider a greenhouse gas and get it to do work for you, get it, start getting it to turn back into the kinds of chemicals that we need. So the hydrogen atoms on the surface can migrate to one another to make hydrogen, but they can also migrate over to the oxygen atom of carbon dioxide, for example, and actually form new chemical bonds. For example, that's an OH bond that wasn't there uh, before the hydrogen atom migrated. A second hydrogen atom can do the same thing. It can migrate over to the oxygen atom. So that's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom that strips out from the carbon dioxide a molecule of water. Uh, so that's a benign product and leaves behind one carbon and one oxygen atom as the byproduct, which you would know and I know as carbon monoxide. And although that sounds to many people like a poisonous gas, to a copper catalyst surface, carbon monoxide is a magical molecule that's a critical uh, catalytic intermediate. So if you've got carbon monoxide molecules on the surface and you've got enough of them, they can start to link up in a chain uh, by a chemical bond, as you see here, uh, and start making higher carbon containing products that are just the types of products we want to be able to turn carbon dioxide into by pumping electrons, ultimately re derived from renewable resources. So once you have carbon monoxide bound, I'll just do that one more time, carbon monoxide's on the surface, it can find another molecule of carbon monoxide and start making higher order carbon containing products that hydrogen can then continue to migrate to and form more types of bonds that eventually get you to more reduced products where you've stripped off the oxygens, for example, like this molecule of methane, ethylene, which is a C2H4. Both of the carbon atoms were derived from CO2. Uh, the hydrogen atoms were derived from water originally. Uh, and the electrons ideally would come from a renewable resource like a solar photovoltaic. So that's great news. A copper catalyst can actually make ethylene, which is something uh, society really needs. We make, again, 200 million metric tons of ethylene on planet Earth right now, uh, but we don't make it from a renewable resource. I'll come back to that. The downside of copper is that while it's really good at making ethylene, it's really good at making a lot of other things. So as a talented postdoc on our team uh, 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 reminded us last week in a presentation, copper is sort of a jack of all trades, but master of none. So it's not perfect, right? Some of the carbon monoxide it, it makes actually leaks off of the electrode and goes uh, wherever it goes. It also transforms some of the carbon monoxide to methane, uh, itself a greenhouse gas, it leaks out some hydrogen and it, of course, can make other things like propane and what have you. So we can't selectively direct the electrons to make just one product yet that we might want. So that's a challenge. And we have to ask, how can we get copper to be more selective for ethylene? This is a big uh, goal. It's an important challenge. And just to remind you, we currently derive ethylene uh, from an in, for industrial manufacturing by cracking hydrocarbons that we get from the ground. That's a very high temperature process that re releases a lot of CO2. You can count it sort of on the gigaton scale of CO2 emissions. Uh, and, and then th that ethylene is used to make all kinds of materials. So for example, the entire plastics industry essentially derives all of that material as ethylene from its starting point. So what we would like to do is close this loop and be able to derive these types of products eventually in a renewable, more benign way uh, that does not produce a lot of CO2 emissions, but instead gives you a, a, a closed carbon cycle. So we're not there yet. That's, this is a tall order, uh, but we have some ideas about how to do this. And uh, I have a close colleague in the Division of Chemistry and Chemical, and a close colleague, an old friend, I should say. We've been together uh, in a variety of uh, uh, capacities for a long time now. And that's Teo Agapia, who's professor in chemistry and chemical engineering, along with me. 
And uh, we began collaborating on this project via the Joint Center, Center for Artificial Photosynthesis about five years ago and continue this work in the Liquid Sunlight to Alliance uh, program. So an idea that we sort of had, but I think we're gonna give joint credit, uh, very much joint credit to the uh, talented uh, researchers that were working with us, uh, in particular, some talented postdocs. Uh, we decided to canvas adding some organic molecules to the solution, to this aqueous solution that provides the protons above the metal catalyst. And so you don't have to worry about the details, but from the top of the screen, I'm showing you some organic molecules coming in that have a positive charge and the negative charge from the electrodes, so that's the electrons, can combine with those organic molecules. And when it does, it does what a chemist says is a reduction reaction. And that reduction reaction forms a new chemical bond between the two molecules that I added. So just one more time, as we pump the electron into the positively charged molecule, we have two of them here. You form a new bond between the two molecules and when you do that, that molecule is no longer charged and it uh, can adjust its position, if you will, and lay down on the surface of the copper electrode. And if you do that many times over, you can begin to deposit layer after layer of these types of molecules on top of the electrode and that will grow up as a film on top of the electrode, if you will. That film uh, <clears throat> then has new properties to do um, electrochemistry. So it controls the transport of carbon dioxide and water uh, in ways that are different than if you don't have the film. And that actually tailors the catalytic property of the copper electrode such that um, you make ethylene uh, as the primary product. So that's very exciting. So now when we take the copper electrode and the CO2 at neutral pH in buffered water solution, we primarily make ethylene. So most of the electrons that we flow through go to ethylene, a little bit more than 70%. And in fact, uh, you can do this over uh, an extensive period of time. So it's a pretty cool result. This is an image of that copper electrode with the film uh, deposited on top of it. This is an image on a micrometer time scale. And if you zoom in for one example of these types of uh, films on top of the copper electrode, you can see a graphic depiction, depiction of the copper electrode. And something that happens on top of the copper electrode is you get this nano faceting of the catalytic sites. And so that gives you uh, additional surface area as well as additional exposure to probably the most active uh, sites of copper for turning carbon dioxide into ethylene. So the background of that is an actual uh, SEM image, image of the copper surface. So this is pretty cool and gives you now a way to take a copper electrode and make a product you might really want, like ethylene. Uh, and so that's a picture in the lower left of what one of these actual electrodes looks like in the lab. And here's a little bit of data on the right. You don't have to worry too much about this. But on the left, in this uh, teal uh, colored line, uh, starting from the left, you see over time that the uh, rate at which current flows is relatively constant over time. And also in these square pink dots, you see that the amount of uh, ethylene that we make, so the number of electrons that go to ethylene product stays pretty constant over a couple hundred hours uh, in this original setup. I want to acknowledge a team from the University of T Toronto led by Tent Sargent uh, for their um, collaborative work in producing this type of data, and we continue to work with them in a variety of contexts. So hopefully with that, you can get a little bit of an idea of just what I mean by uh, taking sunlight uh, uh, and indirectly in this case, we're just using electricity to convert carbon dioxide uh, to pr products that we might really want. So obviously in, in, in this part of the talk, I focused on a chemical feedstock fuel like ethylene, which you can in principle uh, turn into ethanol as a fuel, or you can go directly, for example, to fuels by changing the electrodes. So that's uh, an opportunity and a challenge. So what if, uh, you know, I've just shown you what we might do if we want ethylene, but what if instead we want ethanol, or what if we want propane, or what if we want, for example, propanol as the products? How do we get those? Uh, that's not so easily done. And what we need to think about is how to enhance the rate of discovery by which we can come about uh, new types of products that we might make from carbon dioxide. So the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis and more recently, LISA, have invested heavily here at Caltech in a one-of-a-kind laboratory for enhancing the rate of such discoveries. 
uh, and one of the, uh, this laboratory, which is uh, I think it's still a one of a kind laboratory around the world is led by a, my friend and collaborator and a brilliant scientist, John Grubois and his team that are running a high throughput facility for making discoveries. So let me just show you a quick video uh, of, of what John's team can do. And they can do a lot more than this. But this is a combinatorial sputter deposition system. So this is a bespoke device uh, developed here at Caltech. And if you zoom in, this device can take elements from the periodic table, for example, copper, like we're using for our electrode, and combine it via an ion beam, an ion plasma beam uh, that can uh, be projected onto a substrate surface to give you new mixtures of copper with other elements. These materials can then be thermally processed in a high temperature oven to give you alloyed materials. So copper, for example, mixed with other types of materials uh, that can then be used uh, uh, to screen for the types of electrochemical conversion reactions we're really interested in. So uh, this is an example of uh, a material that's being screened for photochemical water oxidation or water electrolysis, if you will. But we also, uh, or I should say this facility also has the ability uh, to analyze for other types of products that are consistent with electrochemical CO2 conversion. So I'll finish with uh, this uh, <clears throat> one slide that shows uh, <clears throat> some recently recorded data from this combined effort uh, because it, it pounds home this point. So I realize this is a lot of data for one slide and I've tried not to show you too much data in this talk, but for data buffs, I thought I'd show you something. So this is very recently recorded data from this collaborative effort between the groups of myself, Teo Gapia, and John Grigoire and a variety of uh, individuals that are actually the folks collecting this data. And again, what I wanna emphasize is that if you're trying to think about uh, making ethylene relative to other things. So this is a plot of the rate at which we make ethylene versus the rate at which we make methane. If you take copper by itself or combine it with a lot of other metals, uh, you do not change the relative ratio of the rate at which you make ethylene versus methane. Sorry, so if you want, let me just go back to that. Uh, so if you want ethylene instead of methane, this is not a, a viable way to go, to take copper and just combine it with other materials. Uh, or at least other elements from the periodic table to the extent this data shows. It would have taken us about a year to collect this data one point at a time. Each of these is an individual catalytic material and an individual type of experiment. Uh, this data was collected uh, in the period of about a week uh, with, with a fair bit of startup cost, but it actually just emphasizes the power of what you can do in this kind of facility. The other thing it shows is that by taking our additives, so that, that is uh, one of the additives that we can add to the solution shown by this tan color, you can actually get off this linear relationship between ethylene and methane. And now if you look at where I circle in green, you can see that with the additive on top of copper, you can really enhance the rate of ethylene production while not enhancing the rate of methane production. And so that's very empowering because that then gives us a place to do directed research going forward on that type of material. And so this can really quickly expose new discoveries. And the hope would be then that as we uh, start thinking about the types of fuels and materials we might want to make, uh, we can start selecting for some of the other products uh, that one might want to make. So uh, the last thing I'd like to uh, pound home, uh, and I think uh, this part of the talk I'll really pull through relatively quickly because I want to leave a little bit of time uh, for questions, is that I've talked about carbon dioxide, but there are other types of gases that are in the atmosphere that could be good hydrogen storage vehicles. Uh, the primary one I want to point to your attention is that of nitrogen gas, which is about 80% of the atmosphere. So even though carbon dioxide is wonderful to be able to use as a fuel or as a chemical feedstock, it's actually expensive to concentrate once it's already out in the atmosphere, whereas nitrogen itself uh, is in a concentrated form. It's 80% roughly of the air we breathe. So if we can store hydrogen atoms on nitrogen to make molecules of ammonia that we already know can be used as fertilizer, if we can do that from renewable resources efficiently, this is a wonderful molecule to think of as an alternative zero carbon fuel. And so I won't walk through all these points, but uh, suffice it to say that if you can do this from renewable energy, you've really got something to run with. 
The challenge is that we currently make ammonia via a very high temperature and pressure process that consumes a lot of fossil fuel to drive it and therefore puts a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So we need new types of catalysts. Again, it all comes down to catalysis to do this kind of chemistry. This is a fancy molecule that my group works with. Other types of groups around the world are also making interesting molecules for catalytic nitrogen conversion to ammonia. But the, the main message that I wanna leave you with is that as we pursue this, we can begin to think about ammonia, not just as fertilizer, but as an alternative fuel. And if you can do that using electrochemistry, which is just what my lab is trying to work on, uh, you can begin to think about using ammonia as fertilizer on demand where and when you need it, but also as a storable fuel uh, or as a fuel to drive a vehicle. So this is a pickup truck that drove from uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan to San Francisco once upon a time using ammonia as its fuel source. Uh, and if you hand that pickup truck instead off to the Italians, you can make an internal, uh, put an internal combustion engine that runs on ammonia into a much more beautiful looking vehicle. And you can even uh, start to think about powering mercantile shipping via ammonia as a fuel. And this is perhaps one of the early areas where this type of strategy uh, will be used. So I hope with that, I've given you a flavor of what I mean by sunlight to everything taking uh, uh, the source, this infinite, essentially infinite source of uh, energy capacity from the sun, translating it into electrons that can do work, either direct electricity or to store those electrons via so many things we can think of as chemists uh, to provide much of what society needs uh, going forward. So I know I went a couple uh, minutes over, so to thank you for hanging in there. I wanted to thank you with the beautiful image of the building that the Resnick Sustainability Institute uh, is currently designing. So this gives me a chance to uh, once again uh, and very heartily thank Linda and Stuart Resnick for their support of Caltech and the Resnick Sustainability Institute and helping us to leverage uh, 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 the talent of the campus towards so many problems and sustainability. Uh, this is an undulating glass facade that's been imagined by uh, Merdad Yazdani of Canon Design. Uh, this is the schematic design for the new building. I know some of you tuning in, most of you will have never seen this, uh, and it has a beautiful mass timber uh, frame structure. And then this is a nice image uh, <clears throat> of uh, the building from the Beckman Lawn at dusk, at least uh, an artist's rendition of what it will look like. So we're excited to see what we can do on this campus excited uh, to, by the potential of this new research facility that we'll have. And with that, I'll uh, thank uh, a lot of the players that contributed. I've already done that. And I'll end there uh, in order to have a little bit of time for some Q&A. Thanks.